In the summer of 2014, the world watched in shock as ISIL captured Mosul, Iraq's second city, and took control of territory the size of Britain. The brutal approach of terrorist groups in Iraq and Syria was not new. However, the main reaction of the West came when ISIL brutally beheaded American and British citizens in front of cameras. could be sent to Iraq as soon as tonight, although not in a combat role. Is there a threat to the British people? British Prime Minister David Cameron denounced them as psychopaths, but he failed to point out that Britain has a long history of involvement with such groups and has been prepared to ally with them when it suits the interests of Britain. We will expand our support to the Syrian people and the Syrian political opposition with an extra five million pounds in non-lethal practical assistance. Just months before they captured the world's headlines, ISIL and similar groups fighting in Syria had benefited from funding by key Western allies such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and from weapons supplied by the United States and its allies to Syrian Takfiri terrorists. From this building, Secret Service agents were monitoring the movements of supporters of terrorist groups traveling to Syria and Iraq. The question has to be asked, why was no action taken in the past? I want to see if the rise of Tag Fury groups is an unprecedented development, or as has been said by many authors, academics and journalists, that there has been a complex history of British collusion with and promotion of groups remarkably similar to today's ISIL. In my search for finding the possible answer to such a big question, I wanted to be bold and straightforward. So I wanted to see if Britain was or still is promoting Muslim sectarianism and colluding with Takfiri terrorists. Not only are the British government colluding and collaborating and enabling and funding and arming uh, extremist groups, they always have been. Uh, it has been a tried and trusted British imperial tactic. It's understood that if Britain did not uh, create the concept of divide and rule, but has been one of its most uh, uh, sort of promoters, and indeed it is part and parcel of the foreign policy of uh, United Kingdom. One of the methods by which they have divided and ruled uh, is to foster extremism in the hope, belief, that they can control it. George Galloway! Equally bloodthirsty jihadists that we are giving money, material, political and diplomatic support to in Syria. Has the Prime Minister read Frankenstein? And did he read it to the end? If he had read it to the end, he would discover that uh, when you make a monster, by the end it's out of your control. A very important British government document from the 1920s quotes the British politician Lord Crewe on this very policy of divide and rule. This was of paramount importance to Britain at the time. In his book, The Birth of Saudi Arabia, Gary Troller quotes the document which reads, what we want is not a united Arabia, but a weak and disunited Arabia split into little principalities incapable of coordinated action against us. This is an imperial strategy that's been going on for hundreds of years. Empires rule large parts of the world in part by creating conflict. The British and the French in Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere, this was always the strategy. You, you pit groups against each other, you get them vying for power. Um, you sort of solidify identities um, and make them very self-aware of, of different competing identities and then you fuel it with arms. Uh, and you, you support this group one day and then you support another group the next day uh, and then you create this kind of instability. 
In the First World War, control of the Middle East was a key worry for Britain. Here, the divide and rule policies were taking shape, so straight lines of borders were drawn to create new states. The Sykes-Picot Agreement, secretly signed in 1916 by Britain and France, was the fruit of this policy. Based on this agreement, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan and Iraq were established. To secure these policies, Britain made a series of promises to Sharif Hussein bin Ali, who ruled in Mecca, that if he raised a revolt against Ottoman rule, Britain would champion the creation of a pan-Arab state in the region. T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, right after the First World War, he stated that when war broke out, an urgent need to divide Islam was added and we became reconciled to seek for allies rather than subjects. The seeds were sown for the various crises which have affected the region ever since. The shoots and foliage of these seeds are what we see today as brutal takfiri groups. After the First World War, the British Empire was most concerned about Arabism, about Arab nationalism that might unite the Arab world from the uh, Atlantic to the Persian Gulf. Uh, and uh, that would definitely have been the end of empire if that had occurred. So they happened upon the bright idea of fostering uh, Islamist extremism as a counterweight to Arab nationalism. Britain rewarded Sharif's family by installing his sons as kings of Jordan and Iraq, both effectively run by London. But as ruler of the holy places, Sharif had ambitions to become the new caliph, a position left open by the end of the Ottoman Empire. Such an ambition threatened Britain's dominance because it did not want any ruler to grow too strong. British interests were preserved only by division and conflict. Well, there were already contacts during the war between the Saudi dynasty and the British, but essentially after the war there were two conflicts between, in a long ongoing struggle for hegemony in the Arabian Peninsula between the Hashemites, so Sharif Hussein, and the Sauds. What's going on with the British, really, particularly in 1923-24, is the playing off of one semi-client against another. Once more, London used divide and rule and switched its support from Sharif Hussein to his rival Abdulaziz ibn Saud. John R. Bradley noted down in his book after the Arab Spring, ibn Saud founded the extremist Wahhabi kingdom in 1932 with full British blessing. The House of Saud had adopted a preacher, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, in 18th century CE. Abdul Wahhab essentially purported that all developments in Islam since the death of the Prophet were blasphemous and argued for a return to what he termed pure Islam. He told his followers regarding any Muslim who didn't accept his teaching that they should deprive the man of immunity, of his property, and his life. Very like ISIS, by the way, if you study the tactics of Abdul Wahhab 200 years ago or more, you can see without the YouTube, without the film and the photographs, you can see exactly the same tactics followed by Abdul Wahhab of extreme terror, really horrifyingly extreme terror, deliberately deployed in order to terrify the opponents, make them run away. In his article, written in the summer of 2014, Alistair Crook quotes the official historian of the Saudi state, writing about the Wahhabist capture of the holy city of Karbala in Iraq in 1801. He proudly states, We took Karbala and slaughtered and took its people as slaves. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. We do not apologize for that and say, and to the unbelievers, the same treatment. Several thousand Shia Muslims were butchered. Saudi Arabia, uh, the ruling family is Wahhabi, 
and the Wahhabi sect is known for its sectarianism and the foundation of that uh, sect is to be extremely uh, uh, violent against other Muslims whom they deem to be uh, kafir or, or not following the path that they name. The British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Willie Morris, reported in 1968 to Foreign Secretary Michael Stewart under the title of British Policy Towards Saudi Arabia that it is in practice an instrument for whipping up interest and support for Saudi Arabia. Britain's relationship with Saudi Arabia is the darkest corner of this whole picture. Uh, the brute character, sectarian extremist character of Saudi Arabia is so obvious to anyone with eyes that want to see. It is incredible, frankly, I mean literally incredible, that Britain can profess openly to have such close relationships with it. The state drive was in open carriages to the palace. King Faisal rode with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in the first carriage. so that the king can ride down the Mall in an open carriage with Her Majesty the Queen, when he would never allow a woman in his presence in normal uh, circumstances. When his regime, I mean, they talk about ISIS beheading people, the Saudi regime has beheaded uh, one person every single day in the month of August, a record. The way that Saudi money has been used in educational establishments and building of mosques, madrasas, um, in Africa and all kinds of places in the Middle East has spread a kind of modern Islam which the great Islamic scholars that we still luckily have around today say is nothing to do with Islam as it's supposed to be. The rise of extremism of ideologies similar to that of ISIS has been a growing feature for the last 40 years. And I think the main reason for this is the growing influence of Wahhabism. And this, I think, is a very important context in which ISIS and the other jihadi movements have grown up and flourished. Since the onset of the civil war in Syria in 2011, the West and its regional allies had backed the armed opposition with weapons, training and funds, despite the fact it contained groups linked to Al-Qaeda. Over the next three years, these groups became stronger, creating today's ISIL. The terminologies which are being used uh, by the West the use or indeed the misuse of the Quranic words in trying to define barbaric acts. For example, jihad is being used, mujahideen has been used for defining those people who are takfiris, who are chopping people's head off and then associating that with the concept of mujahid. They are trying deliberately to dirty this holy sort of concept. The Western powers and their regional allies like Saudi Arabia uh, always portrayed the Syrian opposition as being much more moderate than it was. They were always talking about uh, backing the moderates against Assad. But it was completely obvious over the last year that the opposition was increasingly dominated by jihadi groups, notably ISIS, but others like Jabhat al-Nusra as well. Perhaps the most revealing comments on the funding and support ISIL had received at its outset came from U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Speaking at Harvard University in October 2014, Biden exposed U.S. allies as the main supporters of Al-Qaeda and ISIL in Syria. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. 
The Turks were great friends, and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. The Saudis, the Emiratis, etc. What were they doing? They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni Shia war. What did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. Except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Biden was forced to apologize to Saudi Arabia and Turkey for the gaffe, but that cannot change the revelations he made. However, Biden did not reveal why Washington and London did nothing despite knowing that their allies were supporting terrorist groups in Syria. Britain even started officially to fund the so-called armed opposition in Syria in 2012, but never revealed the identity of the receivers. In the absence of diplomatic progress, the United Kingdom will do much more. We will expand our support to the Syrian people and the Syrian political opposition with an extra five million pounds in non-lethal practical assistance. William Hague, the then Foreign Secretary of Britain, uh, once had the misfortune to be in a lift with me uh, going up five floors. So he was trapped. And I said this to him, all these people that you are encouraging in their hundreds, now it's thousands, to go there and fight with these extremists, when they come back home, they're going to be trained with a twisted mindset in all the dark arts of terrorism. The bombs that they made, the car bombs, the hideous decapitations and tortures and so on that they have practiced there, when they come back here, they'll practice on us. At that point, the lift door opened and Mr. Haig uh, escaped, so I never did get uh, a reply. Although I did ask, uh, as I said, David Cameron on the floor of the House, if he would explain for the House the main differences, just the main ones, between the Al-Qaeda we're supporting in Syria and the Al-Qaeda we're opposing everywhere else. He had no reply. The traces of collusion with Takfiri radicalism can also be found in the story of Britain's attempts to retain control over the Suez Canal in the 1950s. The Arab nationalist leader Britain hated the most was the President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. He came to power in 1953 and first succeeded in removing the vast network of British bases which were there and then in 1956 in nationalizing the Suez Canal, refusing compensation to his British and French owners. In 1956, Britain and France, in alliance with Israel, invaded Egypt in an attempt to seize the canal back. France and Britain issue a 12-hour ultimatum that all fighting must cease. Within hours of its expiration, Britain's warplanes are winging their way to Egypt and its bombers attack five key cities, including Cairo. It failed in part because of Egyptian resistance and in part because the U.S. didn't support the old empires asserting themselves like that. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. In the circumstances I have described, there will be no United States involvement in these present hostilities. Britain cast around for allies against Nasser, and its eyes fell on the Muslim Brotherhood, despite the fact that when Britain had ruled Egypt, it had suppressed that organization. At that point, the Islamist forces, the Muslim Brotherhood and others, weren't the major threat, and therefore they could be suborned, or the, the, the attempt could be made to suborn them, against uh, against Nasser, who was, who was suppressing them. The rise of Arab nationalism also cemented British and U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and other autocratic regimes in the Persian Gulf. Dana Rezke argued in 2012, quoting from a document which reveals the Britain's necessity to get Saudi 
backing at any price. The document's entitled, The Report by the Joint Intelligence Committee, Nationalist and Radical Movements in the Arabian Peninsula, and it's dated 10th of February 1958. It reads, Arab nationalism, including the urge towards greater Arab unity and the removal of any foreign control, is already the most powerful emotional force in the area, and it is beginning to penetrate even the most remote corners of the peninsula. The conclusion was, the maintenance of our interests in the Persian Gulf states is dependent on continued stability in the area. At present, only the rulers can provide this. No other alternative regime is in sight. The Cold War extended the scope of collusion with Takfiri radicalism to countries beyond the Middle East. By the late 1950s, both London and Washington were viewing Indonesia with concern. They saw its nationalist leader Sukarno as an enemy because he allied with the Communist Party and was friends with China. In the project to overthrow Sukarno, again, British and American imperialism identified the most extreme uh, so-called Islamic elements to act against the nationalism of Sukarno. In 1957, he nationalized companies including the Indonesian offshoot of the Anglo-Dutch oil giant Shell. Britain and the United States determined to use right-wing army generals and the Darul Islam group to foster rebellion against Sukarno. In a document I have here written in 1957, Britain's Commissioner General for Southeast Asia, Sir Robert Scott, told the Foreign Office, I think the time has come to plan secretly with the Australians and Americans how best to give these elements the aid they need. He added, referring to Sukarno, I believe it should be one of our aims to bring about his downfall. The decisive moment in the history of Britain and the West's involvement with Takfiri radicalism came in 1979 when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan to bolster a pro-Moscow regime threatened by Islamic Bedouins. F. William Engdahl, in his collection A Century of War, Anglo-American War Politics and the New World Order, quotes from Dr. Bernard Woods, well known for his hostile attitude towards Islam. He stated, at the meeting of the elite Bilderberg Group in May 1979, British-American Islamic expert Dr. Bernard Woods said, that endorsing the Muslim Brotherhood would allow the Western elite to promote balkanization of the entire Muslim Near East along tribal and religious lines. This balkanization process would result in the rise of various autonomous groups and the spreading of chaos in the Near East. In what Lewis termed an arc of crisis, the chaos would eventually spill over into the Muslim regions of the Soviet Union. This would help Western elites counter Soviet moves. I went to Kabul in 1981, the first time when the Soviets were still there. Uh, in fact, they'd only just come two years earlier. And the embassy, uh, British embassy, was open, and so was the American embassy. And they used to feed propaganda about what the Mujahideen were doing. And it was relayed to briefings, which I also attended in Islamabad and in New Delhi, where you wouldn't, you, uh, the briefers were from the US or British embassies who were telling us that the Mujahideen have captured this town and the government has suffered a defeat in that town and uh, they're on the run and the helicopter by the Soviet helicopter has been shot down here and so on. And these briefers were all officials of the Western governments. So it, everybody knew that, that this was a fiction and a propaganda and a military war being run by Western governments. The continued troubles in the Middle East Famine and oppression in Africa, genocide in Southeast Asia, the brutal occupation of Afghanistan. The with Margaret Thatcher in Downing Street and Ronald Reagan in the White House, the Cold War with Moscow was hotting up. I have taken the exact speech of Margaret Thatcher from her speech record. In this document she declared, it is in our own interests, as well as the interests of the people of the region, that they build on their own deep religious tradition. 
Just what that religious tradition was is best illustrated by the Afghan widows that Britain and America were arming and funding. The absolute classic case, the, the sort of stereotypical case, is the support that the Americans gave the Mujahideen in uh, Afghanistan in order to drive out the, the Russians. Um, as, uh, as Brzezinski, one of the, the dons of, of US foreign policy, famously said, what's a few stirred up Muslims compared with the defeat of the Soviet Empire. Now, of course, after that, we found out exactly what the cost of a few stirred up Muslims was. And the whole route of the, the, the strength of the Taliban and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan was a, sort of a direct result of that, uh, of that American policy of, of funding them. In the 1980s, when under the totally immoral policy that my enemy's enemy is my friend, Britain, with the United States obviously as the senior partner, but uh, Britain under Mrs. Thatcher's administration, was fully involved in developing what became Al-Qaeda and what became the Taliban. And they did so on the principle that these people were fighting the Russians, or the Soviets to be more precise, and that uh, we would support them. Britain supplied arms and training to the Mujahideen forces fighting the Russians. I can tell you that even in Fort William, in the northwest of Scotland, at the military base there of the uh, Royal Marine Commandos, extremists, so-called Mujahideen, in the 1980s, received training. The Taliban were able to use blowpipe anti-aircraft missiles supplied by Britain to the Mujahideen. These are the famous blowpipe missiles, and then they were overtaken by the American Stinger missiles, which brought, you know, their man-held, shoulder-held, and can fire at aircraft in the sky. The British worked with the Americans in a covert program, codenamed Operation Cyclone, to raise a powerful tac fury force to fight in Afghanistan against the Soviet occupation. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. It is believed Brzezinski, U.S. National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter, was behind this operation. Millions of dollars were spent for a decade in the 1980s on training and weaponry to tac fury groups that later established Al-Qaeda. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Al-Qaeda came into existence with the blessing of London and Washington. The tunnels that Bin Laden later used in Tora Bora to hide from the Americans were partly financed by the CIA because uh, Bin Laden you know, had a construction company at that time and it was also a jihadi and uh, he was making money and making jihad simultaneously and the CIA was helping him. Until 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, followed two years later by the collapse of the Soviet Union, global policy in Washington and London was dictated by the needs of the Cold War. After 1989, that changed. The end of the Cold War was rapidly followed by a series of American-led wars on the Islamic world, beginning with the war which followed the occupation of Kuwait by the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein in 1990. Less than a week ago, in the early morning hours of August 2nd, Iraqi armed forces without provocation or warning, invaded a peaceful Kuwait. The Saudi royal family had been terrified when Saddam's armed forces toppled the royal family of Kuwait, but the Saudi king was happier relying on the United States. Elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. 
I took this action to assist the Saudi Arabian government in the defense of its homeland. This state, which has been the best friend of US, Britain, or Western interests for decades, since its inception in the 20s of uh, the 20th century, uh, this state uh, has been the main source of fundamentalist uh, uh, propaganda. A pattern had emerged when Britain and the U.S. saw that when they shared interests in Wahhabis and similar groups such as Al-Qaeda, then they could make alliances. But if these groups opposed their imperial interests, they would quickly turn on them. IS is indeed a byproduct of, the, of Wahhabism. For instance, the anti-Shia uh, sectarianism is one key feature of Wahhabism. American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Occupation forces took advantage of the tribal and religious differences in Iraq. These differences were elevated into hostile conflicts through a process that the occupation itself supervised because the occupation faced enormous resistance from the people, opposition. So divide and rule became essential to maintaining the occupation. They started either funding, creating secret militias, which try to uh, use violent uh, methods against uh, Shia or against Sunni and so on. It's very common amongst Iraqis. They say the same person who blows up a Shia uh, uh, mosque will go the next day and blow up a Sunni mosque. This has become a current saying in Baghdad itself. Probably one of the greatest examples of that is the case of two British soldiers dressed up in Arab clothes with false beard and with bombs and ammunition in a car which were arrested by Iraqi police officer. And they were taken to the police station to be questioned. They refused to answer why they were dressed up in that way. They said that they need to talk to their commanders. Of course, then British forces then actually uh, took over that prison and, and freed the, the SAS soldiers, but actually took a military operation. You don't need to be a nuclear scientist to recognize that in the height of creating these conflicts between Sunni and Shias, two uh, British soldiers dressed up in that way with bombs and so forth, um, what else could they have been involved in? And it's very easy for them one day to become uh, a Shia attacking Sunni and another day a Sunni attacking Shias. The British were very keen really not to pursue this matter. So here we have, they were encouraging the militias, they uh, then got involved in a battle with them, there were some uh, people killed, and yet they keep quiet. But how do we explain that? Well, of course, it's not really reported in this country because it appears that a, what's known as a D notice has been issued where the media are told that not to speak about something and often they will comply. These, are, these can be put down by the police and by the security services and it seems in this case they may well be complying with this. In 2014, Iraq was torn apart by the rise of ISIL when whole swaths of western Iraq fell under its control. Elsewhere is the history of MI6. Author Stephen Doyle quotes from a Foreign Office document written in 1993. The document is titled, Islamic Fundamentalism in the Middle East, and it notes, Private Saudi and Gulf money donated for Islamic causes is a common factor in much of the region. Saudi Arabia has been funding uh, the extremist form of Islam, which is deeply opposed to other forms of Islam. Uh, and as well as the West, and it really is playing a very game. They might think that Saudi Arabia is on the West side. Saudi Arabia is on its side. London was well aware money was flowing into the coffers of bin Laden from the elite of Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states. Further light on the relationship between Britain and America on the one hand and Al-Qaeda on the other 
is shown by Christopher Andrew in his book, The Defense of the Realm, The Authorized History of MI6. He notes that in the 1990s, while Britain and America were aware that Al-Qaeda was waging war on them, Bin Laden was a guest in London. Andrew writes, Yet Bin Laden stayed in London in 1994, setting up an office in Wembley. He returned regularly in 1995 and 1996 using a private jet. The fact that London had become a place of refuge for many Wahhabis and Salafists had become a cause for concern among Britain's allies. Many believe that Britain was prepared to accommodate them under tight surveillance because they were useful tools. For instance, in trying to topple Gaddafi in Libya, a number of these people claimed they had an agreement with the security forces, that they could do whatever they wished as long as they did not create instability or unrest in the United Kingdom itself. Howard Alfawaz, head of Bin Laden's London office in the mid-1990s, told a Swiss journalist Richard Labavier in 1998 that London is our association's headquarters. The authorities are very tolerant as long as one doesn't interfere in questions of internal politics. The BBC's security correspondent Frank Gardner recalled in 2012 how he was introduced to Howard Alfawaz in August 1996 in London. He writes about his encounter. It has been reported that during the 1990s he was in regular contact with Britain's domestic intelligence service MI5, an arrangement that ended in disappointment for both parties. MI5 appeared to be hoping that Mr. Al-Fawaz would provide them with an insight into Islamic extremists living in Britain. Mr. Al-Fawaz was under the impression that his contacts with the security service would keep him out of trouble. British and American collaboration with Takfiri radicalism continues with the Takfiri militancy in Libya against the regime of Colonel Gaddafi. Britain is bombing uh, Libya in defense of what they are calling a revolution, which was actually a very chaotic, lots of different people opposed to Gaddafi. And Gaddafi was brought down, let's be quite clear, he was brought down by British and French bombing. He was not brought down by his own people. In 2012, a former head of MI6, Sir Richard Dearlove, visited the capital Benghazi and reported it was rather fundamentalist in character. I can say this because I have here a copy of the speech Dearlove made to Chatham House here in London. Senior government figures were also quoted as saying they were alarmed by connections between rebel groups and Al-Qaeda. This led to an exchange in the House of Commons between the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Douglas Alexander, who said that he was against arming these Libyan rebel groups, and the Foreign Secretary, William Hague, who said, I think it would be right to put emphasis on the positive side. British author Mark Curtis, the author of the book Secret Affairs, Britain's Collusion with Radical Islam, gives us more insights on these cases. After the fall of Gaddafi, swaths of the country were controlled by Takfiri groups and there was no stable government. Writing the 2012 edition of the book, Curtis says British oil companies have secured lucrative contracts. However, Libya set the stage for Western intervention in Syria, where once again Britain found itself arming and training forces linked to Al-Qaeda. By 2014, Western intervention meant that chaos and slaughter had spread to Syria and Iraq. That's another prime example where there's been regime change and of course the result has been uh, the, the death of even the, the US ambassador in Libya. Libya has now been pretty much divided up between armed groups, it's been destabilized. Any sort of hope that there, that there was after the removal of Gaddafi has pretty much uh, evaporated. There's been uh, divisions in the country between the different parts of Libya uh, that did come together to, to form Libya originally, but we see the Benghazi uh, region possibly going its own way. And again, the country is largely dominated by various different militias. That is hardly inducive for economic growth. In November 2014, The Guardian reported, the Grand Mufti Sheikh Sadak al-Gharani has been banned from entering the UK 
after it emerged he has been helping direct the Islamist-led takeover of Tripoli from England. It emerged that Al Ghariani had been living here in Britain for several months and broadcasting from his brother's TV station based in the city of Exeter in support of Takfiri group Libya Dawn. The day after Tripoli fell to Libya Dawn, he broadcast in celebration saying, I congratulate the revolutionaries in their victory. I give blessing to the martyrs. There was no explanation from the British government as to why Al Ghariani had been allowed to live in Britain, why he was free to broadcast and why the TV station could operate from Exeter. In recent years, Britain has become a global center for the television industry. Unfortunately, several channels have been broadcasting a sectarian message targeting fellow Muslims. Ofcom, the body which regulates broadcasting in the UK, has rebuked critics of Israel for their statements on TV but it seems silent on the broadcasting of clearly sectarian broadcasts aimed at fellow Muslims by these channels. These channels, which are not great channels, no matter how many times people are complaining, including ourselves, we have made a complaint, we are not really getting anywhere uh, with that. The question remains why such TV channels are freely preaching their hate messages using British space. Can this be an extension to the divide-and-rule policy in its new format? London has also been dubbed Londinistan due to the long record of Britain providing sanctuary to right-wing Islamist groups. It's about time for the whole West to realize Islam is the truth. Omar Bakri, the founder of al Muhajirun, told The Guardian, I work here in accordance with the covenant of peace which I made with the British government when I got political asylum. The British government knows who we are. MI5 has interrogated us many times. I think we now have something called public immunity. I believe the French who coined the term Londonistan because at the time they believed it's difficult to prove that uh, the British authorities, uh, whether that's the intelligence services, how high up it went, was uh, giving a uh, safe haven to extremists uh, just in the sort of tacit uh, agreement that they wouldn't then conduct terrorist operations within the UK. In August 2005, Michael Clark, Professor of Defence Studies at King's College London and author of Terrorist Attacks in Britain, The Next Phase, wrote in the Guardian newspaper that the covenant of security between the British authorities and leaders of Muslim communities was a well-understood compromise. There would be high levels of toleration in exchange for self-policing. Former Cabinet Office intelligence analyst Crispin Black described this covenant as the long-standing British habit of providing refuge and welfare to Islamist extremists on the unspoken assumption that if we give them a safe haven here, they will not attack us on these shores. The September 2001 attacks on the New York World Trade Building and on the Pentagon in Washington saw Takfiri radicalism promoted to enemy number one by the United States and its allies, above all Britain. But despite a torrent of Islamophobia from the Western media and Western politicians, the collusion in Britain with Takfiri groups did not cease. I found an official Foreign and Commonwealth Office document which explicitly outlines the intentions of the FCO to court Yusuf al Gharadawi who wished to visit Britain. The document was written by Mokbul Awe, the Islamic Affairs Advisor to the FCO, in which he stated that excluding the Sheikh would be wrong because of his influence in relation to our foreign policy objectives. Mokbul Awe goes on to say, having individuals like Karadawi on our side should be our aim. Excluding them won't help. In the course of making this documentary, Britain once more went to war in Iraq fighting ISIL fighters. Yet there was little, if any, reference to the fact that ISIL was able to use arms sent by the West to the Takfiri terrorists in Syria. 
They started funding these armed groups inside Syria. NATO in general, the CIA established a center in Turkey to so-called vet the groups, the organizations, the personnel, that who receives which uh, sum of money, who gets which type of arms inside Syria. And a lot of these arms and funds went into two organizations, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a branch of Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic State of, uh, of uh, Iraq. And many other extremist groups have all been on the receiving end of vast subventions of British money, uh, British material, so-called non-lethal military aid, communications equipment, money. So the British taxpayer, directly and indirectly, has helped make ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda in Syria exactly uh, what it is. What this tells us is that the whole imperial um, strategy of trying to destabilize our societies by backing one group against another, of trying to manipulate the internal development of domestic politics in different societies by backing some Islamist groups or nationalist groups like the Iraqi Kurds is an entirely destructive policy. And time and time again, it's backfired on the imperial powers themselves. Um, address first of all the evidence of Britain's direct involvement in, in terrorism before going on to, to look at British writer Mark Curtis, formerly a research fellow of Chatham House, has written an important study of the collusion between Takfiri radicalism on the one hand and the British government and intelligence services on the other. Curtis writes, The US has been shown by some analysts to have not showed Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. But Britain's part in fostering Islamist terrorism is invariably left out of these accounts, and the history has never been told. Yet this collusion has had more impact on the rise of the terrorist threat than either Britain's liberal culture or the inspiration for jihadism provided by the occupation of Iraq. The British don't do these things because they like extremist Muslims. Matter of fact, they don't like them. It's just a tactic for them and it's one that has worked so why stop using it if it works I doubt if they will learn their lesson I see no evidence that they learned any lessons from before somewhere down the line whether it's one year two year five years or ten years there's gonna be a blowback from that and yet they never seem to learn the relationship between London and Takfiri radicalism is a long and complex one. But put simply, when it suits its interests, Britain is prepared to ally with such groups and then turn on them when they are perceived as a threat to those same interests. The question that must be asked of the British government is why today it wages war on ISIL on the one hand, but on the other it is prepared to side with similar groups elsewhere when it deems it necessary. History suggests the results of such a policy have always ended badly.